five, four. Hey everybody, Eric here with Biz Talk the Show, and um, doing something a little bit different. We're doing some virtual interviews because we don't have the money to fly all over the place yet, but we're working on that. Um, I am interviewing Mr. Robert Gonzalez from Winebow Imports, and um, he's not the owner of Winebow Imports, but he's a subject matter expert, and it's really important that we have him on. First of all, I'll just give you a really quick background. I hired this guy back in like 1990 something or other. Um, 93, 94, something like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, to work at that time, I had a comic shop. Um, and uh, we lost touch over the years, but uh, this man reconnected. He hunted me down and reconnected me. And it's not because I owed him money. Um, but, uh, you know, it was really cool to hear his story. And I thought that I just, you know, we briefly touch on that story a little bit as an entrepreneur and how he got to be a subject matter expert working for uh, an amazing company like Winebow Imports. Um, and we're just going to sort of go down that road a little bit. Uh, Robert, tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, well, um, you know, I left. I left the New York, New Jersey area around 1999 and settled out here in Arizona and uh, started um, just working my way up, bartending, serving. I always enjoyed the, the hospitality industry. I really had no idea what I wanted to do from an educational standpoint. I, I got into NYU. I was summarily expelled two years later for poor grades. I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, delightful waste of money and time. Uh, figured I needed to just shake things up and 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 figure out what it is that I wanted to do. And I thought uh, restaurants is a great way to keep myself busy, make money, learn. And I just, I always like people. Um, I, I like, I always loved food growing up Cuban as you know, you as with an Italian background, no food, such an integral part of family right. get togethers. Um, so I kind of kindled my love for restaurants and for people. And um, after a couple of years of doing that, Went to culinary school, got a degree in culinary arts, uh, started working at multiple resorts, restaurants all around the valley, working two or three jobs over the course of a week. I was, I was constantly running around because I wanted to learn as much as I could. Uh, my goal was I wanted to open up a restaurant by the time I was 30. Uh, when I wasn't working, I, was, uh, I had a couple rental properties with my brother. We were flipping homes. I'm doing drywall, um, <laughs> finishing floors, whatever I could to put money in the bank uh fast forward to about 2007 and i'm approaching 30 and i'm engaged i got a wedding coming up you know clearly i like to have a lot of irons in the fire um so, entrepreneurial spirit yeah yeah you know you just got to keep yourself busy got to have a lot of things going uh but i found a space it was a nice little um community environment a lot of good traffic flowed through some really nice zip codes that surrounded it so affluent community and uh, started endeavoring on that in, two, in 2007. Uh, it was supposed to be a quick build out. Wasn't, didn't need a lot of work. I, I got, uh, I think, four or five months rent free from the place that I was leasing the space from. But uh, as we all know, once you start doing permitting and city work and stuff like that, timing all goes out the window. Uh, so I got my first dose of what it's like to work with the city and, and bureaucratic red <laughs> tape and uh, found out that when the inspector comes to inspect, uh the property and make sure your build does that he stops automatically at the first impression because you got to fix that i can't go on anymore until you you fix that i'm like well can you at least can you walk through the whole thing and tell me everything i gotta fix He's like nope yeah fix that and i'll come back and then we'll start this over again so uh you know mm -hmm. my quick build out took about nine months i opened up in uh in 2008 uh, a month before my wedding wow and, yeah you know, and around that same time, uh, I mean, it was just it was just a perfect storm of so many things going on. Um, you know, the housing market was on the verge of collapse. I think it collapsed uh, towards the end of 2008, beginning of 2009. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being that I was I was counting on that neighborhood traffic flowing through. Uh, fortunately, it didn't really hit me right away. Uh, I actually had what, uh, you know, a business owner's perfect dream over the next year and a half of people not using credit and using more cash. So. There you go. So, you know what? You know what cash allows you to do. I'm not going to say it on the recording, but <laughs> we all know the benefit of that. Um, you know, and but we, we still, in spite of everything, you, you control what you can control. You advertise. You get out there. It, it's amazing how many hats you end up wearing. 
you know, it was a small place, 2,000 square feet, 40 seats, uh, plus the bar and a couple patio spots. So it wasn't a huge place, but, you know, I was the main chef at the place. I was also the general manager. Uh, fortunately, my wife was really good at uh, operations and accounting stuff, so she, she helped me out with that at the time. Uh, we postponed our honeymoon. I actually, she reminds me that I still owe her a honeymoon to this day, which we just, you know, work, kids, all this sort of stuff, just snowballs. Um, but um, like I was saying, you know, five years is a great run. Started learning more about wine as I was getting in there. Um, you know, being a small sit-down place, um, you learn very quickly about what your guest wants. Uh, is very different from what your vision is. So I had I had a pan Caribbean restaurant, Babalu's Cuban Cafe. I'm Cuban. I also have Spanish background, so it was Cuban food. It was Caribbean, South American, Spanish food, and I. When in my head, I created a perfect uh, wine menu to complement it. It was Spanish wines, it was South American wines, which were all great value at the time, uh, but um, not not that well known. So Arizona, being so close to California, they love their Napa Sonoma wines, uh, those big name brands. <laughs> and, uh, people are scared to try something that they don't really know about. I mean, as it is, I can't blame them. They're already co coming out, taking the chance on a on a very ethnic type place. You know, so I learned I had to give them something of a little bit of a comfort. So mm -hmm. after a few months of not seeing great wine sales, I, I threw on a California cab. I threw on a California Chardonnay, a couple things that resonated with people. And I quickly saw my uh, <clears throat> my sales come up in wine. And that now because they had the thing that they were used to, they were willing to try the thing that they didn't know all that mm -hmm. much about. And I think that's something that can translate to almost any business. You know, your vision versus how your customer yeah. is going to interpret that. You have to find where those two can connect, you know. And in this case, for me, it was it was figuring making that connection with wine. So, you know, and, just let me jump in here with a quick well, question on that, um, because I think you touched on something really, really important here: vision. Right? Every entrepreneur has a vision, whatever that vision is. It could be like massive scale. Yep. It could be tiny. It could be I want this to be like my mom's home cooking. Um, and I think as you know. You 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 noticed or you realized that you had to overcome that ego because right. that's ego, right? The vision is I want it this way. That's 100%. ego. Um, so you you saw that there wasn't just these sales that you knew as an expert in food at this point, and becoming even a, a greater expert in wine. You you knew the pairing, like you were an artist because culinary is art, right? Hundred percent. So, so at what point did you say like was was it numbers? Was it was it feedback from like direct feedback from the clients? Like what made that? Um, what helped bring that connection? Like I need to bring in the familiar and the comfort. Wh where was that? It was both things. I mean, it was the feedback of the guests. Um, you know, guests can be, but guests can be brutal sometimes when they say, "Look, I don't know what the hell this is. I don't know if this is any good." You know, you want me to spend. Ten dollars on the glass, you know. Ten dollars. This is two thousand eight. You know, I mean, it's inflation has been crazy the last couple of years. So ten dollars can get you quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you want to spend ten dollars on uh, on this glass of wine? I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what the hell it is. If this could suck, yeah. You know, and um, so their feedback can be some of them. I mean, when you're dealing with the public, you are going to have your abrasive assholes that just feel like they can say whatever the hell they want and because you're there to serve them it is what it is but you take everything in stride now the people were a little bit more diplomatic about it uh but also just knowing um from having worked in restaurants about how the um how the breakup this much should be food sales this much should be um uh spirit sales this much should be beer sales this much should be wine sales and i just i really wasn't hitting the wine mark at all people were i mean it was abysmal uh mm -hmm. in comparison to where it should have sat in the uh in the percentage breakout of everything right um so you, you know those two things and i um uh, i had to again you know tamp down my ego and be like all right fine you know i'll get sure. i'll get a, a very fruit forward high alcohol cabernet from california and i'll get a super buttery uh oaky chardonnay to make if it makes people comfortable and it allows them to open up and go into other things and so be it and you know, at that point, I I decided not to keep it all Spanish. I started playing a little more. I, I kept a couple South American wines that I really liked. I kept a couple Spanish wines that I really liked. But then I really just started diversifying my menu a little, uh, my wine menu a little bit more. 
I uh, started playing with things. I, I would do things where I'd have a wine of the month and I'd pair it up with a with a date night on a Wednesday mm -hmm. where you'd get a bottle of wine and a couple of entrees and an app for you and your significant other to come in. And I'd use that as a testing ground for wines. So it was a wine that I bring in. I'd talk to my distributors about, look, do you have anything interesting, different, anything that's on your goal list that I can that might work for me that we can put on there and we'll advertise. You get to advertise the wine because I know that as a distributor, you have to do a certain number of advertisements in your different accounts that you can bubble back up to the leadership. You win, I win, I get to bring, try something new that my guests get to experience. Uh, if they like it, I'll put a check on it. We'll revisit it down the road when I rewrite the menu, maybe we'll bring it on. So you just find a way of kind of including things that people are asking for, make it monetarily feasible and a value item for you. You find a way to work with your partners um, because, you know, again, going back to the whole ego thing, if, if all you want to do is this certain style of thing and you're working with a distributor, the distributor, for an example, Southern Glaciers, which is the biggest distributor in the country, you know, they have all the major spirit brands. They have probably thousands of wine brands. So they're they're tasked to do certain things. Now, if you want to take their time, but you don't want to work with the brands that they're being asked to do something with, you know, you kind of go down the rung on, on how important you are to them. If a mistake sure. happens... You got to deal with it when they can deal with it. So you find a way to make yourself valuable to your distributors that you depend on for your product. You find a way to make yourself valuable to your guests by bringing in stuff that they ask for. You might find a way to make yourself valuable to yourself by by doing things that economically make sense for your business. So it's it's, it's a dance. I mean, it really yeah. is. It, it, it really is. Everyone. Obviously, you're wearing multiple hats, but yeah. you're a visionary, you're a professional, you're an expert. You know, like there's a lot happening. And, you know, suddenly you're making this shift and you're, you're seeing these successes. And then after so many years, you're not a restaurant anymore. You've left the business. What happens there? So, like I said, we, I'm dealing with the, uh, the, the great recession uh, that happened and uh, saw business. Uh, had a couple years where predominantly cash. But then 2010, 2011, I'm seeing uh, revenue uh start to come down to uh to catch up to operating expenses you know started people would come in they'd buy a bottle of wine they'd buy a couple appetizers everybody get an entree they get a dessert and then it went from okay well no more dessert and we're just gonna each get a glass of wine and then it went to you know just one appetizer to maybe no appetizer now shared plates so you, you see this as people are trying to find ways to tighten up the budget uh you're seeing your revenue go down catching up to expenses uh you know, as a restaurant, you generally want to have the rule of thumb. They say 18 months, but it's really more like two, two and a half years. You want to have that in cash reserves to cover those bad times. And, uh, you know, I, I had that in place. I was I was putting money back into the business, but it's um, looking at the whole picture. I had two young daughters at the time. Uh, the second one was a surprise, an Irish twin, um, so to speak. And cash flow is going down. I mean, my wife. God bless her, is covering the majority of the bills. Um, have an opportunity if somebody wanted to come in to buy the business. So I sold the business uh, end of 2011. And 2012, jumped back into the workforce. Uh, I went into resorts. I worked for uh, Starwood Resorts uh, up in the Scottsdale area uh, for a couple of years. From there, switched over to another resort. Um, I, I, was trying to, I was trying to go to places that had good wine programs, places where I could learn, uh, work with people that were big in the wine industry, had some good psalms uh people that i could learn from and build on my knowledge uh ended up uh making my way to sanctuary resort which at the time had an award-winning uh wine list had a had a uh a, a very recognized psalm so i worked with him for a little while um he left and i got the opportunity to go to fox restaurants they wanted someone to run their wine program at what was their flagship restaurant uh, fox restaurants is a is a chain that's right here in arizona they grew up super super huge sam fox is a genius in the industry um he's his first restaurant failed but uh he's only closed one up one of the restaurants since then uh recently sold in the last few years sold to cheesecake factory for a quarter of a billion dollars and he worked himself in where he still maintained to be the um consulting partner in the whole thing so the guy's just a genius sure um, sure so i got to work for him at their at their flagship restaurant i i managed a uh uh, a wine inventory of something like seventy-five thousand um, dollars. Just some outrageous wine, screaming eagle, abacus, really, really cool 
uh, unique wines. Um, so I got the floor cell, uh, teach the staff. Um, so, uh, so at this point, you're an expert, basically, from from being an on from from culinary school to now. You have become this, you know. I mean, if you're working for a company like that, you've really yep. worked your way up in in the ranks um, as an expert. In, in at least in my opinion, I'm sure there's some wine connoisseur out there going, "No, no, no," you know, I mean, screw them. Yeah, um, there's, there's a lot of different. There's a lot of different uh, certifications. I have I have two different certifications. Um, one is a sound certification with a smaller guild. It's not the one. It's not the big one that uh, that people. Um, that you see a lot of people with the big pin on 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 their lapel from, but it's the same information. Sure. Um, so, so you, I mean, you, you clearly it's still that entrepreneurial spirit in my my. I mean, because at this at the, at this point, you can not necessarily work for Winebow and become just this consultant or around consultant. So you, but but you hung your hat with with Winebow, and you know before we run out of time, I think. One of the things I wanted to ask you, because again, we can come back here and talk about your story all day. There's all kinds of <laughs> inspirational uh, breadcrumbs in there. Um, so I think it's important, like we, we got your backstory and um, we understand that you're the guy. You're the guy we want to talk to if we want to know about wine. And that's awesome. But now from an entrepreneurial and fusing the two together at, from the from the F&B industry to where you sit now, I think what are some of the things that that restaurants maybe they and and you had mentioned it like not working with your distributor, you know restaurateurs and people they 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 should be doing with a company like Mindball with somebody like you what should they be doing to better themselves to better their business to build the relationship with someone like you and and, and your company. I, I think what they need to do is um, I mean the thing with restaurants you you can be so so busy that sometimes you you just. You're running around. Your hair is always on fire, and so like you, you try to take on whatever is the most eminent thing that you need to take care of. And sometimes little things like a wine list or a cocktail list, uh, maybe you pass that on to the lead bar, you know, the lead the lead bartender or something like that to uh, to handle and and because they're listening to the customers and um, and they know what they're asking for. So they just put this together and put on whatever it is that people are asking for, which is which is a great it's a great thing to do. To, to utilize that that customer input, but and utilizing your uh, your employee that is there on the front line is also a great resource. But what the employee might not be thinking of is profitability, um, uh, availability of the products, mm -hmm. um, current trends. So uh, you know, get that information from your frontline guy. Get that information from your guests. But talk to your distributors. Talk to your importers who know about the wine and know what training, know what, um, uh, know what the inventory is looking like. You know, if you're something that, you know, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is super popular as a buy the glass wine. Well, if you pick one that, uh, one particular supplier that maybe he's having supply issues over there, or there's a supply chain issue coming from New Zealand. Now you put it on your list. You paid for, maybe you've advertised it. Maybe you've, you've spent money printing the list out. You got all this beautiful paper inside these beautiful wine books. And now, a month into your program, that wine is no longer available. It's out of stock. So now, now every night you got to go. You know, uh, every time somebody's asked for it, uh, you know, I'm sorry, that wine's unavailable right now. We do have something else. So it, it's it, that can be a very difficult thing, contentious thing to deal with. You can, especially if it's a high end restaurant, you will piss off guests <laughs> easily. Yeah, right. Like that. So it's there's a lot of aspects to take into consideration. It it is worth taking the moment in your day to to talk to either your distributor or uh, and find out the in and outs about that product, uh, about what the trends are, about uh, you know what people are looking, how are the buying trends are going. Uh, it's Right now is a really crazy time in the wine and spirits industry. I mean, we have, uh, we have uh, The Who, who's going out and a lot of other major health organizations saying that no alcohol at any time is good for you whatsoever. You got to stop drinking. You know, and it, even red wine, if you say it was great cardiovascularly for you, they're, they're putting the kibosh on that. So we've actually seen the last year, it's been very difficult on our side of things um, uh, from a number standpoint. So well, we did, nobody's shutting down fast food chains. Well, nobody's shutting down fast food chains, yeah. no. The, the who is it coming out going, stop eating them greasy burgers. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's challenges everywhere, but... Um, 
you know, the, the thing is, wine, spirits, and food, profitability, your number one profit maker is going to be your spirits. Sure, sure. Number two right. is wine. And then food is 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 going to be your, your lowest profit margin. I mean, the general trend at a restaurant is to, if you have a wine by the glass, let's say you have an $8 glass of wine uh, put on your menu, the chances are that that bottle costs somewhere between seven, eight or nine dollars. You're trying, you're trying to collect the price of that bottle on that first glass of wine. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about waste. But you know, you sell all four glasses before uh before the bottle turns bad, you 300 percent profit you've just turned around on sure. that bottle. You know, so, so so a small business comes in, they come to 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 you guys, to you at um at Winebow, and um they're new for argument's sake. They're mm -hmm. they're infants in the business, you know, and they want to have a wine, you know, really good wine menu, you know. Uh, startups obviously have a tough time. Like mm -hmm. they have no credibility, they have a lot of times don't have any money. So you know, how are they breaking into a distribution company? You know, like yours and, or an imports company? Or, I don't know what is it? Distribution, imports, whatever. <laughs> so so in, in the grand scheme of things, in the U.S., we're we're the third tier. So it's 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 importers. Uh, creators, then there's distributors, and then there's the frontline people. So we technically sell to the distributor. The distributor technically sells to the restaurant, to the retail place, and then okay. the consumer comes in and buys it. Um, but I still sell. I still go out there and I'll sell to restaurants as well. I'll work with my distributor and seller. I'll go and I'll show my wine. But technically, we're we're the entry. We're we're the top. We feed to distributor. Distributor feeds to the frontline uh, and consumers. Okay. So, um, but I'm sorry, you were you were your question was just uh, curious, like how does somebody new, you know, startup, okay. like how are they getting like again? A lot of times it's no money, mm -hmm. right? They're they're spending all that money on build out, they're spending yeah. all this like marketing, yeah. etc. Um, you know, Gen generally the distributor will seek you out. I mean, uh, um, a good company will have somebody that's looking at all the pending liquor licenses. When you apply for a liquor license, I mean, it, again, all that bureaucratic red tape, it takes months sometimes. You can't you can't finalize your liquor license until you have your certificate of occupancy at your place. Once you get your certificate of occupancy, then you can go back to the Department of Liquor Licensing and Control and say, okay, you can send down your officer to inspect my place because you have to show them where you're going to store the liquor. Uh, who's you know who's the one that's that's taking the uh, the liquor class that is the the one that knows about over serving and all the legal stuff you have to do. Once you check all those boxes, then they give you your liquor license. One that when that liquor license becomes active. All the distributors get a get a get a ding. They get a notification, or they have somebody that looks for those notifications. So now the act, license is active. Now we can sell. Gotcha. Distributors want that opening liquor order, right? Liquor okay. Order is usually a few thousand bucks, sometimes upwards of twenty and thirty thousand, depending on how big the place is. You know, okay. that's great. And the distributors want to be the first ones to do it. They want to become your friend. They want to be your go-to person. They want to see if they can get the well, if they can get the wine by the glass. If they can get the beer on tap. You know, they want they they want your business. They're gonna buy for it. They will do they will do staff trainings for you. They will come in and if if it's you know, some people will try to justify and say, like, well, I need to have at least 50% of the menu so I can print it for you. And then I can also come in and train for you. But almost all of them will be willing to train your staff on the on their products that you're carrying of theirs. So okay. I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of things that come off of your shoulders as the entrepreneur, as a business owner. By partnering with your distributor, sure. you know, they will print menus for you. They will come in and do trainings. They'll bring in sample bottles that you don't have to pay for because they can legally sample it out because everybody has a sample budget and ability to do that. Every state is a little different in how that happens. So uh, check locally <laughs> with what your rules are. Disclaimer. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, they can usually pull samples for a training event and stuff like that. And, and it doesn't come, it doesn't affect the owner. So now your staff okay. is now case of the wine, which is integral. Uh, because no server wants to go and talk about something they don't know about. Yeah, you know, they got to taste the food so they can talk about the food. You know, you should have them taste the wine and the cocktails if they're of age for that. So that way they can talk about it, I guess. But um, the distributor or someone like myself can come in. Like I keep, I know where my products are. I have a, I can open up my thing and I can see, oh, this restaurant has my stuff. This restaurant, let me go say hello over here. See if they have, if they need a training, come in, I'll bring a bottle. Let's talk about it so I can sell more wine. Sure. So, so we're out here. We're chomping on the bit, wanting to come into your place and help you sell. So you hear that, all you young, aspiring, and even old entrepreneurs? The asses need to like open the doors and 
invite your distributors in and talk to these guys um because like you said they're chomping at the bit and especially now alcohol is absolutely 100 percent evil currently according to the world health organization um you know it's it's there's always a, there's always something it's always you know there's always something yeah. but if there's one thing that we can absolutely say and we're not promoting the alcohol or drinking or anything we're talking about small business but the vikings knew their shit with their meat let's face exactly. it this is like you know we break good business is 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 a lot of times over food and, and drinks yeah. you know you're always making relationships over yeah. food and drinks exactly. um you know and and so that's never gonna go away mm. so listen um roberto so if somebody wanted to get in touch with winebow imports how would they do that we have a website winebow.com uh on there it lists um we are uh, i work for the import side but we also have a dis uh, distribution side i believe in new jersey and new york we have our own distribution side of the company there okay. Uh, also in Florida, Chicago, and California, Oregon, Washington, I believe we 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 are an importer and a distributor. I'm with the import side, so I work with everything from the New World, that's Australia, New Zealand, South America, uh, and we we are now importing quote unquote wines from within the U.S. as well. We're we're working with them to make sure that to help them distribute their wines here across the country. Uh, so we have our import side, we have our distributor side. If you want to see what we, what states we distribute in, what products we have available, um, careers, uh, information about, um, information about, um, about the wines, uh, Ron Edwards, who is a master sommelier, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal guy. He knows so much about everything that is fermented, distilled, um, there's a link on our webs on our website about him as well. I mean, he's just an absolute genius. So, so let me ask you this because I we don't allow selling on our show, and that's my rule. So, but Good rule. I think you I think you really hit on something when you're talking about you know where you're located and this and that. And my 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 question this is going to be the final question before we wrap. Um, you know, do obviously you guys aren't. It's not all 100% in house. You buy from the, the, you know, the company buys things it needs from other companies. So on the website, is there a way for a small business to to reach out to the organization and say, hey, listen, I sell barrels or I make barrels or whatever. I make corks. You know, can it, it can they contact somebody from there? Yeah, we have we have a list of of people within the company there, and it has their contact information. Um, uh, so it'll direct you to. You know whether it's HR, whether it's person that's in charge of certain divisions. So their information is there, and you can, of course, send send an email and be like, "I have this resource. You know, is this something? Can we talk further about it?" So yeah, there is okay. there is opportunity to contact people and become part of our supply chain. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, Robert, thank you on such short notice for 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 being interviewed. I thought it would be really cool to interview yeah. you, not just because I, I I know you, but because I thought you had a really cool story and a really thank great you. history um and uh that's pretty much it so we will uh wrap up the show listen folks thank you for watching and um go out there and make some shit happen thank, thank you for having me on man it was a lot of fun it was great seeing you <laughs> take care <laughs> later buddy